When I started the Metroid season, I set a Patreon milestone for a bonus episode. The milestone was literally twice as much as I was getting, and I didn't really know if it would happen. But to go back even further, three years ago now, I started working really, really hard on making good content. Because I had a dream. So to be here actually doing this bonus episode, to hit 10,000 subscribers and then to double that with 20,000 before I could even finish this script, to still be here, still trying to make this dream come true, and to finally, finally feel like everything I've done over the past three years is paying off, I have all of you to thank for that. Without you, I'm just a dork babbling into a microphone. You make all the time that I've put into this worthwhile. So from the bottom of my heart, to everyone who has ever taken the time to watch this channel, thank you. Every one of us on YouTube, and for that matter, every video game series out there, lives or dies by the support and passion of its fans. It's just too bad that Nintendo doesn't see it that way. August 6, 2016 was the 30th anniversary of the Metroid franchise. 30 years of Samus Aran, the Space Pirates, of cohesive worlds, commitment to continuity, and stellar, groundbreaking games. Nintendo celebrated this milestone the only way they knew how. With Styx the Badger! You know, everyone's favorite character from Sonic Boom! Oh, and a few weeks later, here's the first Metroid game in six years. It's a chibi go-op action game that literally nobody wanted. In 2017, it is safe to say that the Metroid franchise has settled into its second Dark Age, one that's now lasted nearly as long as the first. For the past seven years, cameos and spin-offs are all Samus has had. It's been almost 13 years since the last 2D Metroid. It's been nine years since the last game that anyone actually liked. And seven years ago, this game seemed to tear the heart out of not only the series, but its fandom as well. But I know from experience, fandoms have a funny way of surviving, and even thriving, through times like this, and Metroids is no exception. The fans have never stopped believing in this franchise. I've read countless articles begging Nintendo to make a real Metroid game. I've seen reviewers get death threats for daring to give Donkey Kong Country positive coverage, because Retro Studios had the audacity to make that instead of more Metroid games. <laughs> Despite that, I'm proud to count myself as a new member of this fandom. But long before I came to appreciate Metroid, there was a fan by the name of Milton Gwosti, who went by the alias Dr. M64. After Zero Mission's success, there were a ton of projects seeking to remake Metroid 2 and give it the same treatment that Zero Mission had for the original. So when Gwosti started working on his own fan game in 2006, he chose a rather tongue-in-cheek title. Another Metroid 2 remake. Of course, all those other projects would end up like most fan games and be abandoned. But even when AM2R was the only one left, the name stuck. As the project grew, a small team of dedicated artists, programmers, and musicians came together. It took them 10 years, but on August 6, 2016, all their effort paid off. AM2R was released in honor of Metroid's 30th anniversary as a free download for PC, and it hit mainstream gaming hard. Gamers who weren't even Metroid fans were captivated by the story of a game 10 years in the making and blown away by just how complete it was. Some even said that it was a better Metroid game than Nintendo itself had ever made. I remember seeing this outpouring of passion, all the work that had gone into it, and I thought to myself, you know, maybe I should give Metroid another chance. Less than 24 hours after the game was released, Nintendo issued a DMCA claim to the sites hosting it, forcing them to take it down. Of course, by then it was already on the internet, so no copyright law in the universe can stop it now. But the team did intend to keep working on it, and even released a patch that fixed a few bugs and nerfed Omega Metroids. But about a month later, Milton Gwosti received a DMCA addressed to him personally, and all further development was suspended. After 10 years in development, another Metroid 2 remake ended at version 1.1. Despite that, and maybe it's because I'm a fan, but I was all ready to give Nintendo the benefit of the doubt on this one. I was all ready to excuse their decision and say something like, well, if they didn't want it released, why didn't they shut it down at any point while it was in development? I mean, they had 10 years. You know what? I bet they knew about AM2R, but they wanted it to get released, and they only shut it down afterward to appease their legal department. That's what I was going to say. But then Nintendo threatened to pull their sponsorship of the Game Awards unless the two fan games based on their properties were disqualified from being nominated. Suddenly, I couldn't make that argument anymore. Nintendo just doesn't want people to know about this. Look, Nintendo clearly had every legal right to do this. I'm not arguing that. 
What I am arguing is that doing so was still the wrong move from a business perspective. Worse yet, it made very little difference in actually protecting their intellectual property. Because believe it or not, there is precedent here. I only recently became a Metroid fan, but there's another fandom that I have always been a part of, for better and worse. Critics to this day say that 2006 was the point that Sonic the Hedgehog should have died. But he didn't. Right when there were no real Sonic games worth playing, the fan gaming and modding scene exploded. And Sega, which remember at this time was one of the most backwards, incompetent, directionless game studios this side of Konami, despite that Sega decided to turn a blind eye and let this scene thrive. Here's a particularly impressive fan game that I played back in those dark ages. Retro Sonic, by a guy called Taxman. Taxman would eventually pitch his work to Sega, who brought him on board. He'd spend the next few years proving himself by porting a few of the classics, and now this very same Retro Sonic engine is being used to build Sonic's 25th anniversary game. So how's that for contrast? Nintendo flexes their legal muscle to get fan projects taken down and threatens anyone who dares to acknowledge them. Sega, on the other hand, hires the fans who made those games to create their official Sonic titles. Sega still does what Nintendo don't. I asked Milton Guasti if, on the extremely unlikely chance that Nintendo were to have a change of heart and offer him a similar opportunity, would he be willing to bring AM2R to Nintendo's platforms in an official capacity? Despite what Nintendo has done, Guasti said it would be an honor. Sadly, I really don't think there's any chance of that happening, because Sega understands something that Nintendo doesn't. A game like AM2R like any other piece of fan-created content, whether it be artwork, fiction, or even this video series, does such negligible damage to Nintendo's intellectual property that the pros of trying to scrape it out of existence are vastly outweighed by the cons. Because what was damaged was Nintendo's reputation, and their goodwill with not just Nintendo fans, but the entire gaming community. I owe this season to AM2R, and that means I owe a lot of my recent success to it. I would not be a Metroid fan if it wasn't for this game, and I intend to give it the critique it deserves. That means I won't be giving it any leeway just because it's a fan game. I'm going to allow AM2R to stand on its own merits, and judge it just as I would any other game in the series. So let's get critiquing. Alright, there's an intro sequence. Metroids are a threat. The Federation wants them exterminated. I was the best candidate for- wait, who, who's um- oh, oh it's Samus talking. Okay, you see, the past games established a first-person voice, but, ah, whatever. There's our girl in her adorable little left hand. And okay, okay, that's better. I love the cinematic flyby of the gunship as we get our first look at the in-game engine. But this intro sequence feels unfinished. It fails to communicate the name of the planet the game takes place on, says nothing of why Samus is a suitable candidate for the mission, and doesn't even mention the research and rescue teams that were sent in, which is particularly silly, since this remake, unlike the original, is going to reveal what happened to them. Yes, I know, that's all spelled out in the logbook, but why even have an intro if it's going to omit mission-critical details like this? Where Super Metroid's intro was perhaps a bit convoluted for newcomers, AM2R's has the opposite problem. It omits too much to engage a new player, and it lacks the depth to excite a dedicated fan. A snappy intro worked really well for Zero Mission, and something more akin to that would have been preferable to this. I bet you can't even skip it. Oh. Oh, you can. Oh, I was wrong. AM2R's intro is pretty much perfect. <laughs> for real, though. Like I said, I'm not going easy on this just because it's a fan game. But even though it's a missed opportunity, it is just the intro. Creating specialized art like this takes time, and this is the kind of thing that likely would have been put off to focus on more important things like, you know, the actual gameplay. Just like in the original, Samus arrives on SR-388 with the Morph Ball and missiles. Unlike the original, all of her movement abilities from the later games are also available. Wall jumping, octo-directional aiming, and a brand new mechanic where she vaults over small ledges. The physics are even more snappy and precise than Zero Missions, and enhanced with new animations and movement effects. But if you prefer a different control scheme, she's never been so customizable either. This commitment to player customization is one thing that fan games tend to get very, very right. You can change Samus' aiming controls and weapon loadout to a Super Metroid style, and even turn the new enhancements off if you'd like. And uh, hey, Samus can hang from ledges, 
That's just like in the DDA games. When I noticed that though, I put on my dorkiest pair of glasses and said, well, that's cool for the game design, but it's incongruent with my headcanon about the fusion suit being lightweight, and that's why the power grip had to be an upgrade. But no, no, the power grip is listed along with all of Samus's other default power-ups, which, just like in Super, can be triggered on and off for no real reason at your discretion. Ah, the details! No, seriously, the details. Water drips from the cave ceilings and dissipates when it hits Samus. Subtle lighting effects are implemented for atmosphere, and guys, you can see the Morph Ball turn around. The fact that I experienced the adventure when it looked like this makes me appreciate all the more just how complete the art overhaul really is. It's such a spectacle to see SR388 brought up to these standards, and in a world where so many retro-styled games are 8-bit, it just, it just hits me right here to see such a gorgeous 16-bit aesthetic. Which is why those realistic stock explosion effects all the enemies keep making hit me right in the uncanny valley if you get my drift. And the same kind of applies to the music. I mean, it's a beautiful interpretation of the overworld theme, but it lacks the upbeat energy of the original composition. So, uh, now is a good time to talk about personal, personal preference, preference and, and interpretation, interpretation in old school, school video, video games. games. Ah. Metroid 2 is a Game Boy game. So the graphics, the aesthetic, and what little story could be conveyed were all very open to interpretation. When I described it back in that episode, I used the word swashbuckling. Because of a few key elements, most notably the initial avatar strength of the player character, the ease with which her primary targets are dispatched, and the upbeat overworld theme, I interpreted this game as an action-focused caper to the Metroid homeworld, taking down the universe's greatest threat as its greatest warrior. And what a blast it was. What wasn't a blast was how barren the final area got, and I critiqued the complete lack of enemies because it meant you had to backtrack way too far to refill your health. I focused on how that decision impacted the game design, and then I got this comment, which rightfully pointed out that I had completely missed the point. Upon Samus's arrival, SR388 is teeming with life. But the deeper you go, the closer you get to the Metroid Queen, the smaller and weaker the other enemies get. By the end, the Metroids are all that's left. This 8-bit game is subtly communicating what happens to a planet overrun with Metroids and letting the player experience it firsthand, illustrating through its design why they're the universe's greatest threat. This was one of my favorite comments this season, for the same reason I always seek out analysis from people who don't focus on the things that I do. It enlightened me to details that I never would have picked up on, because I really don't tend to think about games like this. I think about them as games above all else. Nothing else matters to me if it isn't fun to play. It's why I prefer the upbeat music of the original Metroid to the solemn ambience of Super. But Metroid isn't really known for such a cheery aesthetic. And regardless, Metroid 2 can be read so much more somber than I initially noticed. Which is not to say that AM2R is drowning in ambience. It's not nearly as lonely as Super Metroid, or as realistic as Prime. Of course, the central thrust of the whole game is to exterminate the Metroids, so at some point I guess I should stop babbling about aesthetic interpretation and actually fight one of them. And whoa, these are not the same alphas from 1991. Back then the Metroids were squishy and went down fast. Even as they evolved, they only really presented a challenge near the end. What AM2R does makes a lot of sense. The Metroid fights have been made more dynamic and challenging by limiting their weak points and giving them more complicated and competent AI, even within the same evolution. For instance, the Alphas now can only be hit from below, and as you progress, they'll start to dodge your attacks and rush you. The repetitive Metroid fights were one of the biggest problems with the original, and this really is the obvious solution. I'm just not sure if the obvious solution was the best one. Oh, they're more interesting now, for sure, and they're much more challenging, but that second point is kind of the problem. In Metroid 2, the real challenge was just finding the things. Once you did that, it was really just a simple matter of spamming missiles. In AM2R, each individual Metroid fight is much more of a real fight, but it's a fight you'll experience over and over and over again. And because individual battles take so much more time, they're way more of a chore especially because of some frustrating design decisions, like when your missile bounces off a weak spot just because the Metroid is programmed to dodge. But it failed to dodge, yet the game still didn't count it. Even if they were balanced perfectly, the fact of the matter is this. No matter how well designed a boss may be, having to fight it dozens of times is gonna get old. However, this critique only really applies to the Metroids you find most frequently, the Alphas and Gammas. Common as they are, they still only take up a fraction of the game's runtime, but the point stands. 
AM2R's well-reasoned decision to make the fights more dynamic doesn't solve the problem, it makes it worse. In the 8-bit original, these acid pits blocked you from moving ahead. When I played it, I was embarrassingly deep into the game before it really clicked that killing all the Metroids in each area was what caused the acid to lower. I still don't know why Metroids being alive directly controls that, but regardless, this critical part of the game's progression wasn't conveyed well. Well, AM2R conveys it perfectly. You see it happening right after you kill the first Alpha. And in case it still didn't click, Samus's scanners automatically kick in and bring up new information. This is an adaptation of Samus's scan visor from the Metroid Prime series. What I enjoy about AM2R's implementation is how optional it is. If you want more background information and hints, it's all a button press away. The scan happens automatically when you enter a relevant area, so it never forces you out of the game. And if you really don't like the scanner, you can even just turn it off. For the most part, I found it enhanced the experience. The interface in general is just snappy. It doesn't waste the player's time. Fades are quick, transitions are crisp, navigation is simple, and you can even skip item and upgrade jingles and draw in power-ups with a charge beam. And all these little quality of life improvements add up to a superb player experience. When I hit the Chozo Ruins, the first thing I noticed was the music. The Game Boy game only had four real songs, and this grading number was its worst. AM2R takes that melody and mixes it into an introspectively ancient tune. As a remake, AM2R was tasked with finally having to bring back the Spider Ball. And wow, it controls so much better. With a little practice, you can now do tricks like this to get stuck where you need to. And that agility feels good. I was a little surprised that it was still so sluggish, but considering the scope of Samus' arsenal this time around, its steady speed doesn't distract what it used to. What was so cool about the Spider Ball was how perfectly it complemented Metroid's usual exploration and outside-the-box thinking. It was a natural fit for the series that never came back, at least not in 2D. Where Metroid 2 left plenty of its upgrades just setting out in the open, AM2R has a range of new challenges. They're very well implemented, but I do wish more of these early puzzles put the Spider Ball to use. There's just a lot of untapped potential. This was the first section where I started looking at the map, which is, duh, one of the biggest game changers in AM2R. In contrast to all of its previous appearances, there are no map stations that fill out the area, which makes sense. The whole structure of SR388 is a linear path down that branches out, and knowing exactly where the Metroids are would kind of erode the point. Instead of revealing the path, it helps you keep track of where you are, where you've been, and where to look. By this point in the original game, you'd seen pretty much everything you were ever gonna see till the last section. There were caves, there were temples, there were more caves, there was a never-ending cavalcade of Metroids. Well, AM2R is just about to break the mold, and it all starts in this corridor. This is the Ancient Guardian. He serves as a sort of tutorial boss, making sure the player is familiar with all the ways that Samus can dodge attacks. This boss wasn't here before. And this first golden temple is the only temple. All of the others have been reimagined as some kind of functional system within Chozo society, each with their own gimmicks, challenges, and boss fights. I asked Dr. M about this decision, and he confirmed that all of these changes and additions were very much the reason that the game spent a decade in development. But that's not a bad thing. The benefits of all that work are obvious, and it allows AM2R to achieve things that a Game Boy game never could. So back then, this next section was just another temple, but AM2R has recast it as a water treatment facility for SR388, complete with whirring machinery and geysers that blast Samus through the compound. Pushing through these cramped aqueducts reminds me of a summer job I once had installing heating systems beneath houses. Like, the architects really didn't give much thought to who might have to squeeze through here. Though it continues to tick on, the facility has been abandoned for decades. Look at the way seaweed is breaking through the walls. Aw, oh, and that music! What you've been hearing is the main section of the hydro station, but check out what happens when you venture underneath the compound. The soundtrack smoothly transitions into a deadlier remix of the original theme. These transitions have been happening every time I've moved from one section to another, but it was so subtle and well integrated that I hadn't even noticed it until now. The way the music, graphics, and gimmicks within a larger section vary around a theme like this reminds me of the act transitions from Sonic 3, and you ought to know what incredibly high praise that is coming from me. In the Game Boy game, this section featured Arachnus. <laughs> no, that's not Arachnus. I mean, I know it sounds like a spider, but I, yeah, yeah, that's him. Now, back then, he was little more than a forced morph ball bomb tutorial, <laughs> but that was enough to take me down on my first go. He reappeared as the first boss in Metroid Fusion, and AM2R has integrated and improved on that battle, adding a slew of 
with powerful attacks and incorporating an inspired gimmick where you have to bounce him into electrified nodes to take him down. He's a much more significant threat here, meaning it's all the more rewarding when you finally blast him up there and... Oh. Or, uh, maybe he took me down. Again. While I don't think it's skewed as high as Fusion, AM2R is proving itself a bit tougher than the average Metroid. Of course, it probably would have helped if I had remembered to get the Varia suit at the start of this section, instead of waiting till the end. Check this out. For just a moment, Samus goes grayscale, just like the Game Boy original. And stuff like that is one of the coolest elements of the Metroid series. The way that power-ups, tropes, and especially bosses get reused and reimagined throughout. Like, I didn't know it back when I played Super Metroid, but these hostile Chozo statues are actually called Torizo. And I've always thought that's a neat concept, taking what's normally such a welcome sight for the player and surprising them with a boss fight. So, in AM2R, when I got the space jump... Whoa, that's cool. The Torizo has been roboticized. It wailed on me until I learned to dodge, but it wasn't too hard to take down. Now, if this was all there was to it, it'd still be a pretty cool reimagining. But no. This right here is where AM2R takes an old concept and takes it to the limit! Yeah! <laughs> yes! I can see where some people might think that a Torizo statue with freaking jet propulsion is a little too over the top, but I love it. The Torizo dive bombs you, streaking across the screen, and, uh, and then it releases eggs that hatch and home in on you? Ooh, I've seen that somewhere before. I don't know if Dr. M made a better Metroid than Nintendo, but he definitely made a better Reploid than Ridley. More practically, this high-altitude boss serves as a tutorial for that new space jump. The space jump was also in the original game, but back then it required some really awkward, inconsistent timing, and as soon as you screwed up, you'd fall all the way down. It was a lot safer, albeit a lot more boring, to just mosey upward with the spider ball. Not so here. Just like in the GBA games, Samus can start spin jumping in midair, and combining a usable space jump with her modern snappy movement, she has never felt more controllable and agile. By this point in the original, you had almost every power-up you were gonna get, but one of the strongest aspects of this franchise is to always let the player feel like they were evolving, that Samus was always growing stronger and more capable. So when I bombed away these blocks and saw that symbol, oh, I couldn't help but smile. Just like Zero Mission, AM2R incorporates all of Samus' most famous upgrades. And lucky me, the first is the Speed Booster. God, I love this thing! And it's put to use in so many wonderful ways, both for solving puzzles and making backtracking a breeze. And this level design is just so clever. Like, Metroid never had a place like this before, this industrial complex. Conveyor belts are used in conjunction with the Speed Booster, and I love the way these robotic enemies break apart as they take damage. The industrial theme is put to use when Samus takes direct control of one of those robot guards, and it's just such a unique concept. The second half of the industrial complex, or what I've taken to thinking of as the Act 2, this is my least favorite section in the entire game. Look, Metroid games in the past experimented with lighting effects, but they were kept to single rooms or little puzzles. This is an entire section based around fireflies and darkness, and wandering around in the dark for that long just isn't fun. I don't get me wrong, it's an impressive effect, it's just overdone. Plus, besides resembling the graphics from the original game, I don't even see how this theme relates to the industrial complex above. The previous section had a clear divide in nature encroaching on civilization, yeah? You still felt like you were on the outskirts of a water plant, and you were seeing SR388 break it down. Aside from one brief respite back into the facility, there's almost none of that here. The Game Boy original had a ton of convoluted backtracking at this point, requiring Samus to zigzag back and forth through this tunnel, over and over. Back when I played it, I thought to myself that if there was anything AM2R would fix, it would be this. So I was a little let down and a little surprised to discover that nope, it was doing the same thing. I thought that was a little peculiar, but then I came to... a door? Metroid 2 didn't have these doors like most of the games did. What was... oh. Oh. This is what remains of the research crew. The original instruction manual said that they'd lost contact, but the game itself never made mention of it. And it really serves as a reminder of how dangerous this species is because two Alpha Metroids did this to the entire crew. While I generally liked the logbook entries, this was one time I wish I'd turned them off. Finding the crew quarters, seeing their remains, and especially that minimal soundtrack had me putting the pieces together, and the logbook coming up and giving away exactly what had happened took away from that eerie atmosphere. Metroid is real good at telling story through subtext, and this section would have been stronger without it. 
Nonetheless, finding what's left of the research team was a brilliant resolution to the manual's plot thread. The next area was my absolute favorite in the original, the part where I really started appreciating it for what it was. AM2R has reimagined it with the ominous name of The Tower. Deep trenches are hollowed out around this massive structure, atop which sets a monument to the Chozo themselves, holding the entire planet in their hands. One thing I didn't talk about when I covered the Game Boy game was this. Even though you might have fought the same sort of Metroids over and over, the location and hazards did keep things at least a little varied. I bring this up because AM2R expands this to its fullest potential. By this point, Gamma Metroids are becoming pushovers as long as I've got enough super missiles, but <laughs> well, this sucks. But the Gammas should be pushovers by now, because here's where we start encountering the Zeta Metroids. I love these guys. I think it helps that they don't fly anymore, so they can't just home in on you. It feels so much more tactical than what came before, and since there's only a few of them, the fight doesn't get stale. Although, this one really shouldn't be able to knock you completely out of the room. Still, the way these Metroid fights get so much more interesting and fun as the game goes on makes me wonder if they were designed in order. I feel like the game is getting better as it progresses. Given its 10-year development cycle, that may well be the result of the team itself getting more skilled. To unravel the mystery of what the tower is, AM2R implements another new area. It seems the lower half of the tower has been buried. Progression downward is almost agonizingly slow. We're getting closer, yet the game is making us wait, building up that anticipation. Finally, an elevator! Another iconic element that wasn't in Metroid 2. Ah, and even it's slow! But it takes Samus down to the lowest point on the entire map the geothermal plant. In contrast to the research team's demise, this is an excellent use of the scanning function, being used to explain something that really couldn't be communicated through subtext. This area's proximity to SR-388's core allows it to channel that heat, and turbines powered by the hydro station generate energy for the entire planet. The logbook notes that one of those power cells has lost structural integrity, and that a change in temperature could overload it. And, oh look, power bombs just so happen to be down here. I'm not questioning the happenstance of Samus' upgrades being found in convenient places. Uh, stuff like that is just part of game design. But here's what I do take issue with. Overloading this cell is going to lead to a signature of the Metroid series, a countdown escape sequence. So let's see what caused those iconic explosions up till now. Both of Samus' missions on Zebus required her to take down Mother Brain, and she may not have known that the AI would trigger a self-destruct. In Super Metroid, it's unclear what caused Cirrus to blow, but Samus was responding to a distress signal and caught off guard by the space pirates, who got what they came for and probably rigged the station. In Fusion, Samus chose to crash the BSL station in order to wipe out the X. And in Zero Mission, again, she had no way of knowing that the Ridley robot was rigged with a bomb. What I'm getting at is that Samus always had a reason for finding herself in these situations, whether due to her mission or her own goals. But why in the world would she think it was a good idea to overload a geothermal power cell, especially when she's standing right in front of it. Why? Because apropos of nothing, the door locks behind her when she picks up the power bombs. That's just, that's so un-Metroid. It doesn't follow from anything. It happens just to set up the escape. And I'm not usually the kind of gamer who even thinks about this stuff. I mean, I might not have even noticed if I wasn't critiquing, but it stands out in a game that otherwise has its finger on the pulse of what makes this franchise special. However, while I may be overthinking the setup, I have no qualms at all with the execution. AM2R sets itself apart from all those other escape sequences. Where others had boss fights before the escape, this one has a fight during it. And where others had a somewhat logic-defying countdown timer, this one has a temperature gauge. That long, slow route down here now has to be frantically navigated in reverse. And it's set up in such a way that you are guaranteed to make it to these blast doors with literally no time left to spare. And then... Yeah, okay, it's a bit of a cutscene. The gauge goes up regardless of how quick you are, and there's no way to avoid that explosion. But it's so well executed that I don't even care. Metroid can make an impact on you with stuff like this. And that feeling I had when the second blast door just barely didn't open in time, oh, I'm gonna remember that. Now that I've got the power bombs, I can actually blast open this door into the tower and bring it back to life. Again, the logbook is put to good use, as it can now detect that this was the Chozo's weapons research and development lab. And at the heart of it all is the boss of this area, the Tester. A bit on the nose there, another Metroid 2 remake? The Tester is another fantastic boss though, unlike anything Metroid's ever done before. It's a computerized drone used in 360 degree fire tests, and it pulls off a weirdly impressive thing in boss design. Its challenge feels totally artificial, 
It neither knows nor cares that Samus is there. It's just doing what it's programmed to. And its variety of weaponry and defenses means it's a steep difficulty spike. Not to mention a bullet hell, but it is so much fun. Afterward, I noticed that most of these rooms can be burrowed into with morph ball bombs, and they feed down to a hidden entrance into the power grid. I think I missed the path split, and I could have actually gotten in here before I went down to the geothermal plant. It's a nice touch to give the player a choice like that, especially in what's otherwise one of the most linear Metroids. At this point on the Game Boy, that line would have been pointing toward the penultimate area, but AM2R has already broken from that path, and it's about to do so even more significantly. Instead of breaking into the Metroid Hive, the path diverts to a brand new section, complete with its own upgrades, gimmicks, and Metroids. The Distribution Center. The purpose of this operation is to store and wire energy from the core through the rest of the planet, which sounds great, but upon your arrival it's unexpectedly, uh, damp. Super Metroid's Meridia was naturalistic, Fusion's undersea area was a fish tank, and AM2R has its own spin. Something has caused an underground pipe to burst, and water has partially submerged the distribution center. It's an artificial structure that's not supposed to be flooded. I love the contrast between the wide open caves outside and the flooded chambers still under guard inside. Once again, your enemies are largely mechanical, but I don't think AM2R is just lazily repeating itself. I didn't see it before, but a technological motif runs through the entire game. This is where AM2R achieves something the original simply couldn't. In the same way that Super Metroid brilliantly built a cohesive natural world, AM2R shows the remnants of a cohesive society. Every redesigned area informs the function of the others, letting the player experience firsthand the scope of the Chozo race's technological prowess. So it's kind of appropriate that this brand new area would feature gimmicks and graphical effects that couldn't have been done on the less capable tech that 2D Metroids of the past have been on. These Don Maku bots splatter the screen with projectiles when they're disturbed. And I thought the tester was a bullet hell. And these little round power cells have to be bounced into conduits to re-energize the facility. But like the bots, they'll overload if you hit them with beam weapons, which results in this awesome explosion that disables enemies. It also disables Samus' weapons as long as she's in the vicinity of it. And I love that static effect showcasing the interference. All of these functions are taught to the player in simple, direct scenarios then combined and jumbled and just designed in increasingly complex and satisfying ways. It's indistinguishable from the skill curve, the professional design of the very best official titles. The distribution center, true to its name, outputs all over the planet, and so it functions as AM2R's fast travel system. These conduits shoot Samus back to earlier sections, but I was surprised to find that power cells have been deployed in places I had already explored. I can't remember any other instance of a Metroid game so directly incentivizing a backtrack like this. Given how linear the map is, SR388 needed fast travel. It is a little clunky though, that this room full of conduits that lead back to earlier areas also happens to feature the one conduit you need to move forward. I didn't take that one first, and it took me a while to check it, because I had already categorized the room as a sort of level select or a central hub, but when I did figure it out, it led to the gravity suit, and... Heh, <laughs> I see what they did there. Then I found this ominously large, empty room, and just past that, the Ice Beam. But to get out with the Ice Beam, I had to pass through that room again. And... Ceres? Ceres is in this game! He was that tough, speedy snake boss from Fusion, and he was the one who burst the pipe and flooded the whole center. Oh, the fan service! But once again, AM2R gets it! Metroid doesn't do fan service haphazardly, it has to make sense. And remember, all the enemies from Fusion were the X's imitation of species from SR388, so it does make perfect sense that Ceres would be here. But the fight itself is no throwback. It's like a particularly brutal variation on Bot's Womb, as you free sections of the beast and shatter its armor. Aesthetically, it ends up looking a little too gamey since the platforms all show themselves as missile blocks. It's not as tough as Fusion Ceres, but it is probably more fair. And man, the reward was worth it! Back on the Game Boy, the Ice Beam was the first beam upgrade you'd find, but in a game where your beams didn't stack, its usefulness was limited. AM2R let Samus's multitude of beam types stay equipped over each other, and so the Ice Beam is now her final power-up. It has never been so satisfying. Enemies don't just freeze in place and hang in midair. They fall to the ground and shatter, or just die and float upward. Oh, it's awesome and a little unsettling at the same time. It's no coincidence that such satisfying power-ups are in the same area that lets you zip back to the top of the map. 
AM2R subtly nudges you toward giving the planet another tour. And it's ridiculous just how overpowered Samus feels by now. And if you do go back, you just might discover one more new area. And this one is entirely optional. Clearing this gap near the research site reactivates an elevator. <laughs> but I ain't gonna be lazy. <laughs> Seriously, I love that the game just lets you do this if for some reason you want to. It's another great detail, and hey, look, it's the surface, and hey, look, the sun is setting, and, uh... Oh. Huh. This area is the landing site of the GFS Throth, the starship that brought the research team to SR-388. It's... it's enormous, but it's desolate. There are no metroids, and enemies are sparse. Even the music is bleak, so it's appropriate that this area is kind of a tribute to the darkest game in the series, Metroid Fusion. This cave is the same one where the X will infect Samus, a little further down the timeline. And I got that cool, fan y feeling when I found this Fusion-style save point on the Federation ship, right where you'd expect it to be. Trekking to the top deck of the ship reveals the boss of the area. It's called Genesis, and how appropriate is that in a game that is the modern-day epitome of what Nintendo don't? Actually, Genesis is an adaptation of a pretty minor enemy from Fusion, reimagined into something much more dangerous. The logbook claims that these are biologically the oldest creatures on SR-388, but aside from some surprisingly flashy attacks, it's not very hard. The only other thing of interest is the rescue team's vessel, hanging out back there via a very nice parallax scrolling effect. Actually, huh, I found a scientist, but I wonder what ever happened to their rescue team. That the area is so wide open and desolate, I mean, there's no other place like this in the series, and I think it's evoking exactly what the team meant for it to. This is the research team that the Federation failed to save, and so it has the aura of a graveyard. Experienced here, it's a poignant reminder of what Samus is up against. Unfortunately, on my initial playthrough, I didn't actually find it until after everything else in the game, and in that context, it was more of an unsatisfying coda. I mean, I really do see what they were going for, and I do think they pulled it off, but it might have been better served to open up more obviously after you find the research team. After all that creativity, though, it is kind of nice to get back to Metroid 2 as usual. Yeah, yeah, I know how this goes. We find one alpha, take it down, then head down to discover that, oh no, the tunnel's collapsed, and I'll act super surprised when I climb back up here to discover what? <laughs> well, there's the rescue team, but there's no way to rescue them, as the Metroid reveals its final form and slaughters them. It sucks for them that Samus just barely got here too late, but the way they're used to put over the final evolution of the Metroids is brilliant. But on the downside, have you noticed a problem yet? The Omega Metroid has some pretty cool attacks, and it's a neat touch the way its armor opens up when it lunges. But I'm not really struggling here. It's kind of just taking a while to whittle it down. But when it finally did go down, the path opened to the penultimate area, the Metroid Hive. Originally, this place featured nothing more than a boss rush against three of the toughest Metroids in the game. Of course, you could refill your health and weapons if you didn't mind backtracking for 15 minutes, and that you would need to do so was pretty much a given. In AM2R, the music is appropriately tense, and the graphics are repetitive and evocative of the mindless instinct that built this hive. This is where I might have really appreciated that save points now double as recharge stations. Unfortunately, I probably could have done without the recharge this time. This just crystal crystallized it for me. Omega Metroids are way too easy. Either you aim the super missiles well and they go down in no time flat, or you're left with regular missiles and the fight is just boring. I see in the patch notes that AM2R's one and only update nerfed Omega Metroids, but I think they overdid it. Getting through the nest is the last obstacle before the end. It should be challenging, but I breezed through it in about five minutes and was left feeling weirdly unfulfilled. Maybe I should try playing on hard next time because, oh yeah, AM2R adds that too. Same as in the original. It's a winding climb upward toward the final area, supplanted this time with some gorgeous waterfalls and tranquil backdrops. You know, I think this section would have felt better without music. The music from the hive keeps playing, same as on the Game Boy, but if it just had the ambience of the waterfalls, it would have made a better contrast. A moment of silence before the end. At the top of those waterfalls, you come to the Genetics Laboratory, the origin point of the series' namesake, the place the Metroids themselves were born. The larvae swarm from the background, and I was impressed at just how fast they drain you if they catch you. I'd like them to be a threat. Finally, you drop down and discover the Metroid Queen. The final boss was already a real impressive technical achievement for the Game Boy, and it starts out pretty much the same. But after a few rounds, she starts blowing holes through the walls and pushing you back into the lab. 
the Metroid Queen is just about perfect. Even if it does get a little repetitive with how often she pulls back to fire projectiles, it might be nice if she had another attack, but even as it is, it's probably the best final boss in the 2D series from a gameplay perspective. Eventually, Samus is cornered, and the Queen clamps down, looking to finish her off. But I've been here before. I remember how this goes, and committing genocide has rarely been so satisfying. Gorgeous. Just gorgeous. One more time, Samus watches the last Metroid hatch. AM2R ends the same way its 25-year-old predecessor did, not with an explosive countdown, but with an earnest, peaceful trip back to the surface. Although this is the end of the game, we now know that this is just the beginning of the series' most famous arc, and the final screen AM2R shows you is this one. The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. AM2R is not perfect, but most of its imperfections rise directly as a result of the fact that it's remaking Metroid 2, an epic game for its time, but one that was even then flawed at the core. Most of Metroid 2's flaws are circumvented to some degree in this remake, but a few are exacerbated. There's a reason the series didn't move toward this more linear style as it went forward. There's a reason Samus never again had to hunt down the same sort of thing over and over and over again. That stuff only came about because of the Game Boy's limitations, and as a remake, AM2R can't get around it. But let me clarify what I said. AM2R's flaws arise directly because AM2R is a remake of Metroid 2. And that is incredible because this is a fan-made video game. The flaws don't come from engine problems, consistency issues, bizarre difficulty spikes, or even gratuitous fan service. And same as I had to think of the early Metroids in context to their time, I've had to think of every other fan game I have ever played in that context, as something made by a hobbyist. But AM2R is on a whole other level. It doesn't really matter if Milton Guasti and his team made a better Metroid than Nintendo. What matters is that they made a real Metroid game. Because this is a real Metroid game. It deserves its spot in the season, and more than that, it deserves to be held in the same regard as the very series that inspired it. Dr. M and his team created the definitive celebration of Metroid's anniversary, incorporating callbacks to just about every other mainline title, taking the best aspects of what worked in all of them, expanding on those aspects, and forging ahead with their own distinct style. And best of all, the team was committed to continuing development on this game, building on to what was already a complete experience. They planned to add a new game plus mode where the whole map would be open from the start, and beam combos that would allow you to fight Metroids with more than just missiles. And look, the distribution center even has this pipe that you can't enter. Could more areas be added? Yes, AM2R was a modern game that could be upgraded, changed, made even better. Milton Glosty never even asked for donations for AM2R. In fact, he outright refused them, but his team, through thousands of hours of work across an entire decade, transformed a 25-year-old Game Boy game into a playable representation of their love for this series. They gave one of the most important games in the canon the remake it needed, and built a game that could satisfy 12 years of longing for anyone who had ever been a fan. On the 30th anniversary of one of gaming's most revered franchises, Dr. M and his team gave Metroid the celebration it deserved. It's too bad Nintendo didn't see it that way.